Hello, Paul Russo here again. I'm back to talk to you a little bit more about uh, light scattering. <clears throat> In the first two installments, the first two videos, we learned a little bit about what scattering is and why we use it, uh, what typical instruments look like. And then we looked also at uh, a little bit about what electromagnetic radiation really is, um, the pointing vector and so forth. And we talked a little bit about uh, dipole moments and uh, oscillating dipoles in particular. And we saw that there's a sort of a donut shaped uh, radiation pattern. And all of that is for point particles, really. <clears throat> um, and now, uh, which we could call gases, and now we're ready to move ahead from gases to liquids to solutions, to polymer solutions particularly. So let's get started and see how that goes. Uh, we're going to follow um, some very amazing people. Um, there's a guy named Charles Tanford. His book is a must-have for polymer scientists. Van Hold, similar, uh, excellent book, uh, beautifully written book, uh, always nice and simple. I will say every time I um, mention uh, or loan a copy of Van Hold to somebody, I wind up buying another copy because they, they, they quote unquote lose it. Um, anyway, uh, what we'll do is following their footsteps, we'll proceed from single particles, which is where we already are, the donut shaped pattern, to what it looks like for many particles. Uh, then we'll talk about perfect fluids, but there is no such thing actually. Uh, we'll then talk about actual fluids, and we'll deal with dilute solutions of small particles, and finally dilute solutions of large particles. Uh, it is now possible to study um, uh, concentrated solutions and get some information about molecular properties even in concentrated solutions, uh, but we won't cover that. That's a bit advanced. Uh, let's see. I think I went here. So uh, this is our general progression. <clears throat> the one particle solution that gives us the donut radiation pattern, the sine squared theta one, is uh, encoding that donut shape, um, involves, it shows that we have a polarizability squared. Okay, the intensity goes up as the polarizability squared. Uh, polarizability is really a volume. You can think of could think about that as the volume of electrons in the particle, or if they're aggregated particles, the volume of electrons in the aggregate. Uh, uh, the intensity goes down as R squared. That's just your characteristic normal decay um, that's you know, due to uh, uh, the intensity having to be spread out in all directions, um, just as you, know, you would find in Coulomb's law or something like that, or gravitational law. Nothing surprising about R squared. Uh, the intensity uh, is inversely proportional to the wavelength, so red light scatters a lot weaker than blue light. Uh, this is partly why the sky is blue. Uh, you could ask the question, well, <clears throat> because blue has a shorter wavelength than red, so purple has a shorter wavelength than blue, or violet has a shorter wavelength than blue. Uh, why isn't the sky violet? Well, it, that's a combination of things, including... Uh, eye response, you respond, you able, the ability of your eye to respond. So anyway, uh, um, if you look at strongly scattering samples, they often will look a little tinge of blue to them if they're held up in white light because the blue light scatters stronger. And uh, this also explains why sunlight is, is uh, why, why sunsets and sunrises are kind of red light. And uh, we can talk about that or you can think about that. So uh, it turns out, uh, by argument that we won't do in this class, we would do that in the uh, polymer physical chemistry class, though, um, or a polymer physics class, perhaps. Uh, it turns out that if you have n particles in the gas, the uh, scattering just goes up by n, factor n. But then it's kind of a weird thing that happens here. Um, the scattering uh, kind of goes down, uh, essentially to zero again. And you could think about this if you want to, as you know, um, in the n-particle gas, uh, you could think of that as like uh, foggy, 
situation. And if you think about the pure fluid as a, a swimming pool full of clean water, well, you, you actually see a lot more, uh, a lot better in the, in the clear water. So, um, well, uh, as I said, the, the uh, polarizability is uh, something like the volume. And the volume is something like r cubed. And r cubed squared means r to the six. And then, oh my God, uh, that means that, uh, you know, intensity of scattered light is incredibly um, dependent upon the size of the particle, other things being equal. So uh, this means a single object of radius 10 times r uh, scatters the same amount as a million objects of radius r. Or, you know, one object at 2r is equal to 64 objects at 1r. Okay, and the implication here is that dust really scatters strongly in, in these systems. Okay. okay, so we work very hard in scattering to remove um, large particulates that are not really the thing we want to look at. And so uh, some people say there's almost no limit uh, to what you might do to get rid of the, the dust. And dust is not the stuff that falls out of the sky, by the way. I mean, it's all sorts of, that, that's some of it, but it's little pieces of uh, skin that, you know, come off of, from, your, from your hands, um, pollen, uh, smoke, if you have smoke nearby. So uh, dust is a lot of things, um, and uh, it's getting relatively easy to get rid of it compared to what it used to be. Let's see here. There we go. Um, so another way to look at that last equation is to recognize that um, radius to the six, that's volume squared, would be something like for a solid object, uh, mass uh, would be something like the, the mass squared. Okay. And so uh, intensity of scattering is proportional to concentration times molar mass or mass of the whole aggregate if it's an object that's been aggregated. Well, this is extremely important. It's also extremely reliable. This equation is basically as good as the ideal, ideal gas law, and so you should remember it. It really works. Intensity for a small scatter is just proportional to concentration times mass. And so what that tells you, if, uh, if you have uh, a bunch of small objects and they slowly aggregate in time, well, the concentration, this concentration C is in grams per milliliter, uh, that stays the same, of course. Nothing changes about the concentration. But if the mass of the whole object goes up, uh, then you can see it very well. So light scattering is exquisitely sensitive to aggregation, and that's one of its main applications, is to looking at things that aggregate. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, this uh, linear increasing uh, scattering regime uh, does not last uh, forever. Um, if you go to uh, a perfect fluid and you really pack the particles in there, and uh, then you would expect, uh, well, you would find, you probably wouldn't expect it, but you find that there's just no scattering. Uh, now, <laughs> uh, that would be pretty pretty unfortunate if we wanted to use scattering to study simple fluids, which people do. But in fact, it's not true uh, because there's no perfect fluid. And so I want to talk a little bit about this uh, business. Uh, first, a simple reminder that waves that are out of phase uh, cancel and waves that are in phase uh, add. So we've talked about that a little bit already sometimes. Um, and this is a, a, a kind of a construct that we can use. I uh, encourage you to read this at great length on your own, but uh, I'm going to set it up. So this is a region of some fluid, okay? And here's a subvolume of the fluid. This is something like toluene or benzene or something like that, but it's a pure fluid. And the position of this one subvolume A 
and the position of the other subvolume B have been sort of selected by hypothesis. We just sort of imagine it this way. Um, we have selected these two positions to be such that the scattering from them exactly cancels. Okay. If the contents of the subvolumes are the same, it exactly cancels. This is how we set it up. We just drew it up this way. Okay. Now the thing is, is that you can always find a subvolume B that will cancel any subvolume A in this system. Okay. That's the uh, situation. So if the contents of the subvolumes are identically the same, then there won't be any scattering. It'll just cancel. A, this A will cancel that B. Some other A over here will have some other B, maybe over there, maybe over there, uh, that will cancel. So why doesn't this work in practice? Well, because the stuff in the subvolumes is never really the same. Uh, even if it's a simple fluid, let's say toluene or water, um, one little region of space will have instantaneously in time uh, a slightly higher concentration than the subvolume B that is perfectly located to cancel out the scattering from A. So even though the location works, one is stronger than the other. Well, uh, a really nice argument uh, about this is, is uh, given by Richard S. Stein. Uh, actually, I always thought R.S. meant real scientist. So this is the real deal here. Uh, he passed away earlier this year in June of 2021. Uh, he was a marvelous man. He was able to put people at ease, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, some of you will be aware that he uh, uh, founded the uh, University of Massachusetts Polymer Science Program. Some of you will be aware that that is a great program. And the way in which he founded it is really remarkable. He basically had to go to the legislature and get laws changed so that the university could accept money. He built his lab with basically nothing but tools that he could buy at a hardware store and uh, very little money. So a marvelous guy. Um, here he is in Baton Rouge uh, some years ago with his wife. He always traveled with his wife. They made a nice couple, very cute and um, fabulous. If you go to this slide in the PowerPoint version and go into the notes section, there are some stories about him. I won't tell them now, but they're marvelous stories. And he was uh, just, a, just a really wonderful person. Well, um, here's his explanation of what I just said. Here's region A and region B that are positioned correctly so that the scattering from B would exactly cancel the scattering from A. And if the sample is sufficiently large so that you can ignore, ignore end effects, uh, you'll always be able to find that B that cancels the A. But suppose A is more dense than B. Well, then it will scatter a little more brightly, okay? And so it doesn't exactly cancel. This is a wave that's maybe, you know, a, a, a 98 wave on a scale of 100. The wave coming out of that, we'll just say it's a strength of 98. And uh, this one over here is a strength of, I don't know, 95, right? So there's a little excess scattering out of that region, and, and, and you can measure that. So if you put a perfect fluid without any dust or any other problems in it, a very pure fluid into a light scattering instrument, you do see a small amount of scattering. It's there. Okay, um, this is a fun one, and this is how Dr. Stein uh, got famous in a way, uh, was by using light scattering to characterize films. This is one of his most famous experiments. Uh, he didn't have lasers to play with. He's, this is all pre-laser, so he had to do this with regular light sources and optics and polarizers and so forth. He didn't have a camera in those days. He cast these images on a screen and took a picture of them with a 
with a, an actual camera like you would shoot. Uh, and But look carefully what the difference is. In this case, the density is the same. A and B have the same density. But if you look carefully, uh, you'll see that the orientation is different. Yeah, this, this little region here has a different orientation than that little region there. And so that gives a rise to a scattering in a depolarized sense. So here, in our case, we imagine a laser coming in, vertically polarized. It, most lasers are polarized, but not all. Uh, but uh, this will really clean it up so that the light electric wave, electro, electric component of the wave will be vertical. But we only allow scattering to pass in the horizontal sense. So what happens then is you get a depolarized scattering signal and you get these sort of cloverleaf patterns. This isn't a very good picture of them, but they're cloverleaf patterns. And you can use that to characterize the structure of what's going on in this film. So this is polyethylene film, or maybe a liquid crystal would go in here and you can see some interesting patterns and you can work out what's going on in the system from those scattering patterns. All thanks to this man, who on top of that uh, did just so many other things in his life. Uh, really amazing. Uh, here's an actual picture of what one of those clover leaves looks like. Um, I guess this might actually be one of Stein's earlier papers. Uh, and you can actually measure those. Well, um, let's talk about real fluids again, because mostly our portion of the class, my portion of this, is devoted to molecular properties. So let's talk about that a little bit. All right. So this is actually a picture of an ocean, I guess, somewhere, and there's some waves. And uh, there's a direction x and another direction y. And on the z-axis, we'll plot density. I think we could all agree that the density of the water is heavier than the density of the air above it. But you see that the water is crinkled, all right? So there will be some fluctuations um, in density um, you know, near the surface. Well, uh, you could try to draw these waves out uh, by making Fourier sums of all sorts of other waves. All right. So here's a wave um, that you know contributes in some way to the total. Uh, here's another wave that contributes in some way to the total. And uh, here's what light's going to do if we hit uh, light, aim light at these waves. It, it will get scattered off at some angle. And that angle actually sort of winds up satisfying the Bragg condition. Now you have a superposition of waves. You have many of these waves going on at once. So you'll have scattering at more than one angle. Okay, but there will be kind of a, a direction to it for every different Fourier component. Here you can actually see it. This is actually taken on a cruise ship, which is the most decadent thing I've ever done. I'm pretty sure decadent scheme. Um, and we're rounding our. Uh, west here to sail off the San Juan Straits on to Alaska. And uh, I don't know if it'll play again. Probably. But it's okay. You can see that uh, sunlight is not very directed because it's cloudy out, unfortunately. But you can still see where the waves are. And you can see that there's sort of these low rolling waves. Okay, so look at this guy here. Down there. Look at that guy there. Look at that guy there. There's these low rolling waves there. But there's all these little choppy, chippy little waves in there too. Okay. And depending on the angle of the incident radiation, uh, some of it will get reflected to you. And you can see sort of bright spots. That kind of gives us our contrast here. All right. Even though it's not a very directed light source, thanks to all the clouds. All right. So here I've tried to illustrate that, uh, what's going on. Um, here is sunlight and uh, getting reflected, we call it like a Bragg reflection off of these waves, uh, but not very much light getting reflected off these. They're just not oriented right, and they're not at the right angle. Right? So now that you've seen this, you should see it everywhere. You can Every time you see water on a lake, you'll be reminded of this uh, sort of relationship. So what that's telling us is that scattering is a good way to follow uh, these concentration fluctuations, and I'm talking about concentration, like a density right near the surface. There's a variation in the density near the surface. Okay. Uh, we see this again and again in many different 
ways. We have different kinds of concentration fluctuations. Now here are some clouds that are sort of periodically arranged. Here's some more. Okay. Here's uh, some that are arranged this way. But if you look carefully, there's a little kind of a periodic nature that way. And if you aimed a, a very long wavelength radiation, it would really be long wavelength radiation. Uh, it would be scattered differently for this set than it is for that set, okay, depending on how you orient the source. So it would be some very long radiation source, you know. I like this one. This is a good one, isn't it? Look over here. The thing that grabs your eye is these. But look over here. See these little bands in here? So how the light is going to interact with these concentration fluctuations uh, depends on uh, the relationship of the beam and the detector and the wavelength. All right, so this is all getting back. This is really just another way of saying Bragg's Law, which I hope somebody developed for you earlier, but you can de derive it yourself easily enough. Just look up derivation of Bragg's Law. Uh, basically, we find that m, where m is an integer, times the wavelength is 2d sine of half the scattering angle. That's what leads to constructive interference over here. Okay. I'm sorry. Destructive interference every place else and constructive in interference at the specified angle. Okay. So uh, this is kind of a summary for small particles. Um, we see an electric field continually races past the particle. Uh, the electrons inside the particle wiggle and dance, and at a very high frequency, the only things that really can keep up with the high frequency of the light wave <clears throat> are the electrons, the nuclei, the protons and the neutrons, basically stand still. Uh, that sets up a donut-like radiation profile. The light is re-radiated like it was an antenna. Each particle is a little antenna. In a dilute gas, the donut patterns just add. The intensity then becomes proportional to the number of particles. In a pure fluid, in the simplest case, the intensity would be zero, but there are no perfect fluids. And in a real fluid, the scattering geometry chooses one Fourier component. And that component has a certain direction, and it probes a certain characteristic distance, which is 2 pi over the scattering vector magnitude. Okay, so the next stage in our development is to look at um, small scatterers uh, in solutions, a two-component mixture, a solute and a solvent. And uh, this is a subject of a physical chemistry problem or polymer physics problem. Uh, here we're just going to point out that it is kind of complicated and give you the main result. So one way to approach this is to take uh, your volume that contains the scattering and treat uh, divide it into little subvolumes, and you have to choose those very carefully, and then add the scattering out of the subvolumes. And it turns out that this uh, approach, which is pretty much how we got the um, scattering from a number of gas atoms. Uh, works, but only under certain approximations. And the main one that I want you to be aware of is that it works well when you're not very close to a phase separation point. If you're approaching liquid-liquid phase separation, things get iffy, okay? Now, we've seen this plot, or this picture, a number of times. And the, again, the point of it is that uh, scattering uh, re relies on these natural thermally driven concentration fluctuations. In other absolute polymer characterization methods, you have to create um, a concentration gradient. So in osmometry, you create a strong gradient kaboom with a semi permeable membrane. In analytical ultracentrifugation, you create a rather smoother concentration gradient, but uh, you still have to do something, and in this case, you have to spin the sample at a very high rate of speed to make that concentration gradient. But scattering alone uh, has, operates on these nice thermally driven fluctuations. But the question is, how big are they? Right? How big are those fluctuations? 
that controls the amount of scattering that we have. So one way to understand that is described in this little article down here from the Journal of Chemical Education that we did a while ago. And uh, it asks you to consider um, a polymer solution uh, pretty much the way you would treat a, an ideal gas. And so when we talk about ideal gas problems, we often imagine this massless, frictionless piston, and we put some weights on it, and it pushes down on the gas, and we can measure how much the uh, concentration changes for a given amount of pressure, and that's called the compressibility. But we could invert the compressibility, and we could talk about the resistance of the gas to being compressed, and that'd be something like an osmo like a modulus for the for the gas. Okay. Well, when we do this in uh, polymer solutions, it's all really the same. Uh, what changes is that uh, your massless frictionless piston now also has to have lots of little tiny holes in it that permit the solvent molecules to come through, um, but constrain the polymers to one side of the container. Now, if you imagine, let's imagine first that the polymers uh, bear a charge, uh, minus 1,000, it's DNA, big DNA molecule or sodium polystyrene sulfonate or something negatively charged, minus 1,000 on this polymer, minus 1,000 on that polymer. Well, to push them closer and closer together is hard to do. So this is an osmotically stiff solution, has a high um, osmotic modulus. If it takes a lot of energy to make it happen, Mother Nature is not going to do it. She's a little bit on the lazy side, and if it, things take a lot of energy, a lot of effort, um, she just uh, sort of does them a little bit, okay? And that's basically what Boltzmann's Law tells you. So when we try to translate that into scattering, um, let's uh, look at it this way. Here is our, our usual diagram, laser coming from left to right. Uh, hitting um, a Fourier component that's uh, selected for scattering, and the little blue lines are where the concentration is highest, okay? So we're just showing the, the peaks of a, a concentration wave, particular Fourier component that the scattering system has selected to look at. So when it is difficult to uh, make that peak very large, um, that means when it takes a lot of pressure to do it, osmotic modulus is high, it does not happen spontaneously very much, and so the scattering is low. And so that establishes this inverse relationship between scattered intensity and osmotic modulus. If osmotic modulus is high, okay, that means the scattering must be low because of the inverse relationship, right? Well, uh, if we were to write the osmotic pressure, the Van t Hoff equation, we would write that out. It's a linear series of terms in concentration. Um, and then take its derivative, we wind up with something proportional to this, one over molecular weight uh, plus two times the virial coefficient, and this two comes from taking the derivative. That was a c squared there until we took the derivative, okay? So uh, this is uh, the kind of the, the essence of, of how scattering relates to molecular weight. Now I want to extend this to large particles and large polymers. Um, when I look at a particle, uh, here's a, some ugly green blobby thing. Uh, what we have to do is get the scattering from all of its subvolumes, and I've just shown two here. And when light that's coincident and in, in phase uh, comes in and hits the sample and goes off to the, to the detector, uh, the total distance traveled is the same. Uh, so these will arrive in phase for constructive interference. That'll be our maximum in intensity. Uh, as we move away from zero scattering angle, then it is possible that they could even arrive completely out of phase, leading to destructive interference and no scattering at all. Well, the gist of it is that the intensity will go down with angle, okay? Now, the question is, can you see it or not? Okay, so if it's a very small particle, you can't see it. 
Uh, maybe you can see it if it's a little bigger. Here's a nice easy case. When they're super big, it's easy, but they may go to zero and you know, then bump. And so this leads us to the modification of the Zim equation, of the previous equation, which I guess we could call an Einstein equation. Um, and the modification is, at least in dilute solutions, that the inverse scattering is proportional to the inverse of molecular weight, uh, modified by uh, a term for the size, q squared rg squared over 3, and uh, this virial coefficient term here. Uh, if we're talking about concentrated solutions, we can't really measure radius of duration, but we can still get a thing called the correlation length. I'll show that in a minute. Um, if we go to large polymers instead of particles, it's the same. Uh, you, all your subvolumes now are someplace on this rope of <laughs> cooked spaghetti piece. Um, and even so, the main point is that the intensity goes down the scattering angle, and you can measure the size of this polymer. One way to do that, uh, the simplest way to do that, is with these Ginier plots, and they apply when the product Q times RG is about uh, is less than one. Um, it works reasonably well, a little bit beyond that for some shapes, but for any shape, this works well when QRG is less than one. And what you do is you take the log of the intensity and plot it against Q squared, and again, um, you know, if it's very small. There will be no change in the intensity, therefore no change in the log of intensity. Uh, if, if you're very good, you may be able to see, pick up really tiny differences here. Um, and then you know, there's sort of this easy regime, and then there's this sort of weird regime here. Okay, I wanted to put some regular numbers on this from sort of a landmark, so you have a kind of a reference. And uh, in modern instruments, if the radius of duration is bigger than about the wavelength over 50, in vacuo wavelength over 50, uh, you're good to go. It should be possible to do it. Uh, they used to tell us lambda over 20, so we had to look at really high polymers to, to do that. Uh, but now uh, equipment has gotten better, and it's possible to, to, to do this reasonably well, uh, down to 10 nanometers or so. Even better if you're very, very careful. Um, to put that in a framework of molecular weights, um, a famous polymer scientist told me exactly once, many years ago, to remember that the molecular weight of 10 to the 6, a million molecular weight, has a mean square end to end length of 1,000 angstroms. So you see, a million, a thousand, what could be easier to remember than that? To get that into radius of duration, you have to remember that the, for coil, random coil type polymers, Gaussian polymers, um, the relationship between radius of duration and mean square end to end length is a square root of six. So anyway, um, 10 to the six gives you a 400 angstrom molecular weight. That's 40 nanometers. That's very easy to measure. We can definitely get the size of that. As it gets smaller and smaller, it could get trickier and trickier. And uh, you really have no choice except to change wavelengths and that's why we do small angle x-ray scattering or neutron scattering. But we'll talk about those in, 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 in time. Okay, uh, here are some typical Zim plots. Um, these are actually uh, um, liposomes, uh, structures made out of lipids that are being attacked by a particular polypeptide, small polypeptide, and fusing and growing larger. And one of the nice things about measuring Ginier plots here, we can measure them at uh, remarkably large number of points, and we can do that about every 30 milliseconds. So we can follow the time course pretty easily of the, of the change in size when this is sort of a fusion type thing or breaking open or something of the liposome. All right, um, I wanted to give a name to this uh, equation again. I guess maybe I did that. Uh, we'll call it the Zim equation, uh, the right-hand side, inverse intensity, proportional to 1 over m, 1 plus q squared rg squared over 3 plus 2 virial coefficient c. When you deal with solutions that are um, not dilute, semi-dilute solutions, concentrated solutions, the form of this keeps the deep IDC notation, and we talk in terms of being able to measure a correlation length, right? And I think I could convince you that the correlation length will go down 
as the concentration goes up. Why? Because there's more and more strands. The correlation length is kind of the distance between strands. Right? Uh, we haven't made a big deal about this, but uh, even polymers that are not spheres have a defined radius of gyration. In the case of a rod, uh, it's the length of the rod divided by the square root of 12. Right? So anyway, uh, we're mostly going to be operating uh, with the rightmost dilute solution type uh, form of this equation. Uh, reminding um, that the particle form factor, P of Q, is defined as the intensity at some angle or spatial frequency Q divided by the intensity at Q equals zero, which you can only get by extrapolation, you can't usually measure right there. Uh, and this is a number zero less than one. And uh, you can do this, you can change Q by just going to different angles and you can change it also by wavelength. So a red light, long wavelength would have lower Q than a, um, blue light, which have a higher Q. And uh, generally these go down. All right, so the Zim equation is the right-hand side of what we've seen. Um, but we really want to get rid of this constant of proportionality, right? Because you can't really you can't really measure molecular weight until you do that. So in order to do that, we'll talk in terms of a thing called the Rayleigh factor, and it gets this sort of fancy looking R to distinguish it from the gas constant R and another R that enters into this whole picture, which is the distance between your scattering sample and the detector. So this little r here is that distance between your scattering sample and the detector. Well, nobody cares what that is, but you can take my word for it that the intensity of scattering goes down as r squared. Okay, This is basically what happens in gravity. It's, it happens in, in propagation of lots of things. And here in the case of propagation of electromagnetic radiation, Emitted by the scattering object, it goes down as r squared. Nobody cares about that. So what we'll do is we'll multiply that r squared back in so we don't have to worry about it. So is going down as r squared. We'll multiply by r squared. Now we can have the intrinsic behavior of the scattering sample, is. Is also goes up with the volume of, of sample that you detect, which is v. So nobody cares about that either. So we'll divide that out. So what we're really looking here is sort of the intrinsic properties, the intrinsic ability of the system to scatter. That's what the Rayleigh factor is. Um, because of alliteration, the use of two Rs, uh, people like to say Rayleigh ratio. Um, but they really shouldn't, because you can see uh, that this has different units. R squared is going to have, say, units of centimeters squared and volume is going to have units of centimeter cube. So this has really factor has units, and we don't like to call things with units uh, ratios. They're not, they're factors. All right, so this is uh, Rayleigh ratio. <laughs> Rayleigh factor is, is actually um, uh, an intrinsic property of the system. So we know the Rayleigh factor for toluene, we know the Rayleigh factor for water, we know the Rayleigh factor for all these other things. And the question is, what is it for your polymer? All right. OK, so you can't get the um, actual molecular weight out of a proportionality. So we have to find the constant of proportionality. And this is um, uh, introduces a thing called the optical constant, which is 4 pi squared refractive index of solvent squared. How refractive varies with concentration? DNDC squared. We'll often hear polymer, polymer people talk about DNDC. Um, the polymer world would basically be uncharted if we didn't know that, um, except uh, at least the polymer world is understood by light scattering would be. And then we have built in the wavelength dependence of scattering, lambda naught to the fourth dependence, and, uh, and uh, Avogadro's number creeps in here as well. So now we have the Zim equation valid in dilute solutions, which says that Kc over Rayleigh factor is 1 over m, and then modified by the size of the particle and modified by the thermodynamic non-ideality. And the Zim 
uh, um, appearance of all this is called the Zim plot. Here's an example you can sort of see down here. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But in a modern world, uh, it's easy to think about uh, what's going on here is I've got uh, things that I can measure, optical constant, everything in it can be measured or known. Rayleigh factors, uh, we can talk about how we get those. Uh, and what we want to get is molecular rate, rate acceleration and variable coefficient, but we only have two independent variables, Q and C. So in a modern world, whoops, um, go. Uh, we might want to, might be tempted to lay this out in a 3D type plot, okay? And so, you know, we put our angles from 0 to 180 degrees on one axis. And we'll put our concentrations 0 to whatever on another axis. And we'll put the thing we're measuring, K over R, in a Z plane. And we'll go and measure each of these little blue points as an actual measurement. I just sort of sketched them in there. And we'll try to find a theoretical expression that lays a smooth blanket over this. I, this. This is drawn with jagged lines. But what we're really after here is a molecular expression, uh, is an expression involving molecular rate, radius, and virial coefficient that just sort of blankets that nice and smoothly. Okay. Well, even if you did that, which you can do and it actually is done, um, it's not much fun to look at it. I can't just look at that and tell you exactly what's going on. I, well, I guess with some effort I might but it's not as easy. We're much more accustomed to looking at two-dimensional graphs. And Zim certainly didn't have this option, okay? He did not have the option of 3D computer graphics. And he set up a very clever scheme here to get around that. And it's important to know because people still publish Zim plots, and the beauty of them is that they give you a snapshot right away of what's going on. So these are two Zim plots here. One is corrected for absorption. This one is the raw one. Let's deal with that. It's a little prettier. Uh, just looking at that, I can tell you right away that this is a pretty big polymer, and I can tell you that it's in a good solvent. Kaboom. And I could invert this and get the molecular weight. Well, at least I could if I had plotted Kc over Rayleigh factor. I just plotted C. Uh, so in, in our software, uh, we often just plot concentration over Rayleigh factor, and then apply the optical constant at the end. Okay, at the very end, we publish it, and then we, we fix that. So anyway, um, it's worth figuring out how this works. Uh, because he had uh, two independent variables, angle and concentration, and only 2D graphing, Zim decided to add the two. And it's adding apples and oranges to add the angular independent variable and the concentration independent variable. They are different things. Uh, but the sine squared theta over 2, certainly that's going to run up from 0 to 1. We kind of know what that's going to do. Um, and so all I have to do is, you know, take a constant k with in inverse concentration units and multiply it into my concentration and I will give the concentration uh, kind of a comparable graphical significance to the angle. And I'll plot the sum. And then I only have to plot these points once. All right. <laughs> all right. And then I have to figure out how to extrapolate them. So the basic idea is to take the sum of your two independent variables, even though they're not the same things at all. Um, I can tell you, uh, because I remember measuring these data a long time ago, uh, and because of another trick I'm going to tell you about now, that the angles, uh, that, that these long lines here going out this way, uh, these are the angle, these are the data all at one particular concentration. Okay, And um, the shorter lines, which are drawn you know, steeper diagonals. These are data all at the same angle, different concentrations. Um, so what I'll tell you is um, that people often cheat on this business a little bit. 
and I'll tell you how uh, you can know usually whether you're looking at constant concentration lines or constant angle lines. This is a famous Zim plot um, executed by one of the gods of polymer science a long time ago. Lovely looking thing. Look at all those lines. Look at all the, you know, drawn sort of smooth curves through here. They didn't have computer algorithms to draw the curves. They probably used French curve or something like that, which is much fun. Um, but they're actually cheating. They're actually cheating here because, in fact, if you look carefully, the angular trend here executes a small S shape. See the small S shape here? It's uh, slightly more visible over here in the extrapolation to zero concentration. Well, I know that these are the lines. It's sort of more vertical line. These are the lines at constant concentration. And that's showing the angular dependence. If I go back to this one, it was the opposite. See, it was sort of the lower sloped line was the one that showed the, the uh, angular dependence at a particular concentration. So what that means is that these Zim plots can be flipped around. They can do kind of like that. Um, if you watch for a minute my video, watch my face now, you can sort of invert them uh, by how you select the scaling constant. And these guys knew that they had a misaligned instrument here and decided to hide it. Now that's an interesting choice because in order to know that, they, they probably knew, probably made that plot first with a lower constant than 1000. And they probably said, oh my God, we can't publish that. That looks ugly. Um, but think what they had to do to make the plot in the first place. They had to do hand calculate all those factors. Uh, I think they probably would have had slide rules by then. Um, but slide rules don't add or subtract, so all that was done by hand. So you could multiply. All your multiplications could be in slide rule. And then you have to do the additions and subtractions all by hand. Uh, and then you decide you don't like how it looks, and then you go redo it. Uh, so um, <laughs> a lot of work, but a great paper despite this, and, and it doesn't affect their, their results at all. This is another one here, a very difficult situation. This is for um, a polyethylene in trichlorobenzene at a maybe 135 or 150 degrees. I, I don't know. I didn't do this one. I didn't do that one either. <laughs> but um, here it's a little hard to tell which are the angle points and which are the concentration points. At least for me, it is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. Um, usually, you will have more angle points than concentration points. Why? Uh, because it's easy to get an angle point. Just rotate the detector and make the reading, right? To get the concentration points, you have to prepare a new concentration, and it has to be free of dust, and you have to not drop it or spill it or otherwise damage it. So there's all sorts of things that go into making a concentration. Once you've got the solution, why not run a few angles? And so that's what these Doty, Bradbury, and Holzer did. They ran a lot of angles. Uh, I'm not sure, like I said, in this case, it's five of one and four of the other, a little hard to tell. So what I thought I would do now is talk about this program we wrote a long time ago to analyze the Zim plot data. And uh, this, is, uh, this program is uh, kind of an intermediate uh, analysis. Uh, today, what you would mostly do is you would, you know, do a, 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 a solver fit, uh, some sort of uh, fitting algorithm uh, to adjust the molecular weight, the radius, and the virial coefficient until you smoothly blanket your blue points here. Okay, that's what you would do. It'd be ugly to look at. Um, well, it's kind of pretty to look at, but it's hard to actually tell what it means. But as a sort of intermediate to doing it that way and doing what Zim did, uh, we can try to plot data uh, as functions of sine squared theta over 2 and as functions of concentration. We can do that separately. And so this program called non-ZIM that we wrote does that. 
and we'll open a file. This has data in it. Let me try this guy here. It doesn't look too very bad. And what it does is it tells you that you have seven angles and six concentrations if you include the solvent C equals zero. So really five concentrations. So altogether 42 separate measurements of intensity at various combinations of angles and concentration. There they are. And it's easy for us to plot separately against concentration and sine squared theta over 2 and do these extrapolations in various ways, uh, much easier than it was for Zim. So why don't we do it that way? And um, I can tell you from experience that uh, you know this particular point here is bad. Angle, select, angle 7, concentration 1. Let's kill that. Okay. Um, in fact, I really don't like that whole concentration, so let's kill the whole concentration. We'll highlight it by clicking there, and now it's red, and we'll say, yes, kill it. Okay. So we could, if we wanted to, eliminate some other things, but I think that's going to be okay. This is not the most beautiful Zim plot you ever see. Um, I think this must be in water because we seem to have a hot spot here of maybe seven or eight percent. What I'm showing you in this little panel here is the intensity um, modified by sine of scattering angle divided by I90. So at 90 degrees that has to be exactly one. Sine of 90 is one. At other angles we see some variations and we seem to have a little stray light hitting us uh, at one particular angle. Um, Probably not too serious. It might affect things a little bit. We could if we wanted to eliminate that angle. I guess that's the second angle. Why don't we why don't we try killing it and see what happens? Go to kill an angle. Kill that angle. Yes, kill it. So now that's gone. So now our survivors are these ones, I guess. And uh, we have various analyses. What we're going to do is we're going to analyze um, each concentration for its angular dependence, and then we're going to get from that a apparent radius uh, from a Ginyer type expression, and then we'll take that radius and see how that varies with concentration, and uh, then we'll really have it. Okay, so let's do the Ginyer plots. Uh, concentration one was skipped earlier, yes, I know. I have to do the next concentration. There it is. I've seen worse. Okay. Uh, next concentration, also not bad. Um, surprisingly, it got a little bit larger. And generally, we expect these to go down. Ah, now they're starting to go down. Good. Going down some more. So as we go up in concentration, remember that we're really measuring the correlation length, and it only is a radius of duration at zero concentration. So you set all the concentrations, continue. And now this shows us how radius of gyration varied with concentration and did go down. Uh, this shows us how um, the concentration over Rayleigh factor changes with concentration. So that's really a virial coefficient. The slope of that line will be virial coefficient. And now we've got what we want. We have radius and we have virial coefficient. And we have the intercepts from either of those should be somehow proportional to molecular weight. So let's actually compute that. To do that, we'll put in um, a number for DNDC, which has to really be a measured number. We'll put in the number, I don't know, let's put in the number 1.8 for this one. I think that's nice. And if the DNDC is 0.18, our molecular weight would be 417,000. Our virial coefficient would be about 1 millimole per gram squared in our Radius saturation is reported to a ridiculously large number of significant figures. Uh, it's okay to have these things in a working version of your software, but of course we're not going to report this anything like that. Uh, and uh, let's not even get into noise on on uh, light scattering data. That's quite a big deal. All right, so we've actually got everything we wanted to know. We never saw Zimplot. And that's too bad because the Zim plot is so nice, it actually tells you in one picture what's going on. So let's get one. Okay, we'll, we'll make one. Oh, that's how it would look.
ugly looking thing until we do some scaling. That yeah, looks a little better now. Okay. Uh, now I've got the uh, all the angle points steeper, but I can make them. I can flip this thing around, and you get to choose which way you like to look at it. This is the kind of choice. Uh, that puts all the angle points uh, uh, on this direction. And uh, this is the kind of choice a high scaling constant is kind of what Doty and those guys did, cheating slightly. Though I don't think it really matters in this case, and neither one is particularly beautiful. Uh, but I've seen worse. And what you want to do is draw lines through this. Okay, and you could do that manually. But how you would you did how did Zim know where to end the line? If he's going to draw a line through these sort of turquoise points here, uh, where do they end? Well, these are points at uh, I guess the uh, six angles, um, and he's going to uh, extrapolate to angle zero. So what we can do, he actually would say, well, if Q was zero, what would K times C be? Okay, if Q was zero, what would K times C be? So we'll do that. We'll enable those lines, and that's where he's going to draw these lines to. He's going to take and he's going to draw a line all the way across until he gets over to there. Right? Now, the other question he could ask is if C was zero, what would Q squared be for each one? Okay, so we'll go get that line. And so how do we draw these extrapolations? We would draw this one down until it hits there. We would draw that one down until it hits there. Draw that one down until it hits there. So we can do that. We can actually do that. Um, I'm going to uh, leave that on. We'll do these concentration lines here. There they are. Okay. So um, you could say, well, maybe those are not the lines we would have drawn manually. And they're probably not, because this is actually fitting the data uh, in the way that I showed you. We did Ginyar plots as a function of concentration, then we did intercepts and radius as a function, uh, then we did intercepts as a function of, of concentration, and we put in a DNDC value, we got a molecular weight, and so uh, these lines are actually calculated lines. And if it doesn't look like they're the lines you would have drawn, you click this button here and say, help, this doesn't look good, which explains to you that you're doing a theoretical Zim plot based on your on your um, based on your your model that never used a Zim plot essentially. Okay, so that's uh, just a little bit about uh, using this program, and hopefully you have an idea of how to construct Zim plots now. Uh, but the reality is is that we often fit them uh, without looking at them anymore. But still, when you go to publish, you're going to wind up wanting something like this because bingo, you can tell, oh my goodness, definitely it's a big polymer. See, these lines are definitely going up, uh, definitely in a good solvent, and it has a molecular weight. Once we put a, a K value on here, you could kind of guess the molecular weight from the intercepts along these lines. Okay. All right. Let's kill that. Let's move ahead. It will let us. We haven't talked about polydispersity. And uh, I'm going to do this. Uh, eventually, I'll show you some things about polydispersity. But for now, it's important to know that osmotic pressure sees a number average molecular weight, and light scattering sees a weight average molecular weight. Otherwise, they give the same information. If you had a monodispersed polymer, you should get the same answer from either one. Um, the uh, question comes into play, what is the, what average do you get for the radius of gyration? And people will often say incorrectly that it is a Z average that you get. In fact, it is not the z-average. Uh, the z-average, if you really wanted a z-average, you would do this. Uh, the real z-average. Oops. Let's see if we can do this. And a real z-average would be this.
that's supposed to be an M. Okay, that's weird. That would be the real Z average. Okay, that's not what light scattering gives you. Light scattering gives you the square root of the Z average of the squared radius of gyration, so it's complicated. And if you didn't like that one, you're not going to like what you get out of dynamic light scattering any better. Well, the best thing to do about polydispersity is avoid it. And so what will come up next will be a discussion um, of GPC malls. I think uh, we'll talk a little bit about GPC as we do that. Uh, and then we'll see how powerful it becomes when you take a GPC and hook it up to a multi-angle light scattering investigation. There are cases that you um, cannot avoid these crazy averages where light scattering, that light scattering produces. If you have a sample that's reacting, uh, you haven't got time to separate it out on the fly. Uh, if you're looking at aggregating samples, same problem. Um, nothing you can do. <laughs> Um, gelling samples. Uh, sometimes uh, there are samples in very hot or aggressive solvents. You really uh, don't want to put um, chlorosulfonic acid down a GPC. Um, people have done that and they live to tell about it too, but, but uh, you don't really want to do that. Putting hot solvents into a GPC, you can do that now. That's doable. So I'm going to stop there for this presentation. And uh, we'll move ahead and look at GPC models in due course.